Okay, we're back from our break, um, and we're going to start on Lecture 22, The Vikings and the Year 1000, for our second lecture tonight. And here we have our title slide with, a, with the head of a Viking carving of a sea monster. Okay, we, uh, and, and we'll look at the Vikings. We'll return from Africa to the north of Europe, and we'll look at uh, the f areas on the fringes of Europe, on the outside of the center of European civilization. Okay. Um, uh, last time, we looked at Africa, and we looked at the kingdoms of Africa as they developed, and I want to mention that we have a number of very interesting readings on Africa. Uh, one I have in front of me right now is the Ethiopian, Ethiopian Royal Chronicle, which tells the story of Christian Ethiopia, and, and, and this is one of the few primary sources written in Africa by Africans. Most of the other readings that you have, this is in this is in the human record. We have the Ethiopian Royal Chronicle, which is very interesting. In the global experience, we have a couple of readings on Africa that are interesting. Um, we have the Diali Kieba Kowati, the Sanjata, uh, about a historical king, but this is, this is very late, and this is in, in Mali. This is a king of Mali, but it's taken from oral tradition, which is, which is fine, uh, but it's quite late. In, it's, it's about the 11th to the 13th century AD. It's a very late source. Um, there are a couple of other sources that are interesting that I have marked here. Um, and these are mostly descriptions of Muslim travelers who are traveling into, for example, Ibn Battuta traveling in Mali, describes what he sees in African culture. So there, so there are just a few African primary sources that survive, um, and a lot of either Muslim or Portuguese descriptions of what they find as they go to Africa. So we don't have that many primary sources. Now we're going to, let's review what we've seen. We've seen Sub-Saharan Africa and the common culture shared by all Africans that binds Africans together in this kind of an environment. The Berbers to the north of Sub-Saharan Africa, a group of Bedouins in the Sahara Desert. The Nubians to the south of Egypt, again, part of the Sub-Saharan African culture of the village that we saw, and here is Africa that we see in the world as the huge continent to be, uh, that, that, that resisted all invasion for a very long time. Now we're going to turn from this, this fortress that resisted invasion for centuries and centuries, now we're going to turn to the north and we're going to look at a bunch of invaders who traveled all over and invaded everything, and this will be to the Viking world. When we left Carolingian Europe last time, we looked at Charlemagne and we looked at the development of the Carolingian culture, the Carolingian Empire under Charlemagne, and we ended by talking about the grandsons of Charlemagne who divided up the empire. And here we see the division of the empire under the grandsons of Charlemagne. Charles the Bald got the yellow part. Lothar got the green part, the, the kingdom in between, and Lothar was the emperor. And the pink part was uh, given to Louis the German. So we have the Carolingian Empire broken up into essentially what Europe is today, isn't it? This is France, this is Germany, and there's a kind of no man's land in between that was fought over in two world wars, war, World War I and World War II, both France and Germany claiming that middle kingdom. Uh, the sons and grandsons of Charlemagne also claimed that middle kingdom and they claimed each other and they, they entered into a huge civil war fighting each other constantly and they used up all the fighting men they had in France and Germany, and they looked around for more, and where did they find them? They found them in Denmark. They found mercenaries who were there, who shared a, quite a common culture, except that they weren't Christians, but they, they were a warrior society in Denmark. And the, um, 
Charles the Bald, Louis the German, and Lothar hired armies of mercenaries from Denmark and brought them in to fight their wars. And it was at that point that the Vikings discovered that Europe was full of beautiful churches full of gold and silver artifacts of various kinds. And so, in a way, we can say that the Carolingians invited the, the Vikings in to see their culture. Um, as France disintegrated, we have these Viking warriors uh, looking around to see uh, what, um, what pickings there were in Europe. Uh, they were a warrior society, and here we see a Scandinavian warrior. This is actually a chess piece, and it's a warrior with a helmet that is no different from an English helmet. He's got a shield, a kite-shaped shield, that is no different from shields that were carried in, well, it's different from shields that were carried in, in uh, Scandinavia. Actually, they had round shields at that time. And a, a short little stocky horse that is still the same kind of horse that we see in Scandinavia to this day. Um, uh, uh, they didn't have the great uh, chargers that we're going to see in Europe later. But it's a, it's a warrior society. They're Scandinavians. Um, they're often called, we have several names for them, Vikings, Norse, or Norsemen. The, probably the more accurate uh, name for them is Norse or Norsemen. Um, Vikings is a kind of modern label. Um, uh, the proper term is a verb. Uh, it, it describes an activity, and what the Vikings did was to go a viking. And this means that they went out raiding and trading, and they didn't they they didn't distinguish very much between the two of them. They would if they if they approached a castle or a city that was a fortress that was impregnable, they traded and they, they saw them peacefully. If they came to a church that had no military defenders, they raided it and they took what they wanted. Why, take, why pay for it when you could just take it? And so uh, they, they didn't distinguish between raiding and trading, and they were quite a merchant society, quite a trading society. Um, the, the term Vic, there's a, there's a bay that's named the Bay of Vic, and uh, there are various interpretations of that Viking word, but, but it, um, uh, it, it, it was an activity meaning raiding and trading. They spoke Old Norse, which was a single language, and uh, they shared a single culture uh, that, they, um, that they shared together. Um, and they all spoke the same language at first, and, and at the very beginning of the Viking period, there were no countries called Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. There were no countries at all in that northern region. Everybody lived in small local communities, and it was extremely ununified. There was nothing unified about the bright Viking raids. It was just that they burst out of Scandinavia with, with no warning at all, and they burst across the whole world. And, and there, there are two reasons for it. The first is that they had been developing ship technology for really hundreds of years. Here's a Viking ship going out, uh, raiding and trading, and you, this, is, this is on a rune stone. It shows a ship with a sail and, and um, uh, the kind of uh, animal heads on each end of the, of the boat in its characteristic guise, and here they are raiding and trading, um, taking what they want or trading for it. They're, they're raiding at the top and trading on the bottom. And here again is the raiding and trading that they're carrying out. This is a rune stone that I've been showing you portions of, uh, which is characteristic of what they do. So we've got a combination of what's going on. We have this new ship technology that allowed them to build wonderful big ships that they could go out into the, into the, into the ocean, and they could build the same model ship, essentially. Um, uh, they could build the same model ship, and, and it, would, it could sail the, the seas across the Atlantic, or they could build a smaller model that would go up and down the rivers of Europe. And let's look for a moment at the, um, uh, at the uh, uh, rivers of Europe. Uh, with the geography of Europe, you see Scandinavia to the north, and you see um, the coast of Europe 
with its rivers to, to handy to sail down with this wonderful ship technology um, that they had developed. Um, okay. Okay, by and large, there's a combination of the migration movement of the Vikings because of their ship technology and also the weakness of the places that they invaded. Europe was falling apart, the Carolingian Empire was crumbling, and um, politically uh, it, was, it was engulfed in civil war at that time. The other countries the Vikings went to, by and large, they, they, they went to the places that they face. If you look at this map, you will see that Norway, which is on the west coast of Scandinavia, faces the Atlantic, and most of the Atlantic explorers who went across the Atlantic and discovered Iceland, Greenland, and the New World, they, um, they were from Norway. Now, Sweden is on the uh, uh, east side of the peninsula, and the Swedes faced to the east, and it was the Swedish Vikings who went into Finland and Russia and all the way down the rivers to Byzantium. And so they went in the direction that they were facing, and they were the founders of Russia. There was nothing there. There were Slavs who were in, in a very disorganized, um, scattered, sparsely settled uh, region with, without any real organization or unity. And the Swedes went into that area as Vikings and settled and, and really created the state of Russia. Denmark, on the other hand, faces England and the continent. Um, Norwegians did go to Scotland and those islands and Ireland across the north. It was mostly the Danes who went into England and it was the Danes who sailed down the rivers of Europe wherever they found them on the coast of Europe around Spain and into the Mediterranean and to Italy and all the way to, to um, Constantinople and Greece uh, in, in the western part, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. So by and large, they went in the direction that they faced um, in their exploration. Another element that um, uh, caused the Viking migrations. And some people talk about, you know, was there a population explosion, too many people in Scandinavia? And I don't think that's true. Uh, whenever, whenever people burst out of an area and all of a sudden they start attacking the people around them, they say, well, the population exploded. But it's a guess. You know, there's no evidence whatsoever to tell us whether the population did or did not explode. Um, here you can see on this map that the Viking invasions coincided with two other invasions in Europe. The Magyars that you see in the yellow part here, they were Huns. They came from the plains of Central Asia. They were nomads and they were the same kinds of, the same people, descended from the same people as the Huns who, who overran the Roman Empire briefly. So the Magyars were attacking from the east, the Vikings were attacking from the north, and Saracen pirates were attacking from Spain and North Africa. Now these were not organized invasions. None of the invasions were organized, but they were simultaneous. And so you've got Europe in a kind of pincer movement between all of these three invading peoples. And, and one uh, historian has talked about this time period as the crucible of Europe as a time when um, when Europe was tested in the fire and they survived the siege and so that this was uh, this was something that uh, uh, then um, uh, forged the culture of Europe because they were able to withstand all of these sieges. I'm going to give you a slightly different theory at this time and I'm going to argue tonight that it's the Vikings, the Magyars, and the Saracens of those three invaders, it's the Vikings who actually forged Europe, either through their contributions to Europe or through the reactions they inspired among the Europeans. Now, usually when you, usually in, in a world civ course, the Vikings might be ignored, or in a Western civ course, nobody would mention the Vikings, or even in European history, sometimes nobody mentions the Vikings when you're teaching medieval history. It's because uh, it's assumed that they attacked 
you know, like for two generations, and then all of a sudden they disappeared. They just, they converted to Christianity, and then they were just like the other Europeans, and then they're ignored for the rest of European history. Um, I don't think that's true, because I, a lot of my research I do on Scandinavia, and I think the Vikings had a profound impact on Europe, and I'm going to argue that tonight. Um, as, as to what happened because the Vikings invaded Europe and conquered such large areas of it. Uh, they come from a northern culture. It's a, it's a very interesting northern culture. They're children of the frozen north. They live a very hard life among the ice and the snow, long, long winters where the sun doesn't come up for weeks. And, and short summers, where you might have sunlight all summer long, you have the endless summer, but it's a harsh climate and, and very cold and icy. Uh, it's a hard place to survive, and in the long winter nights, they would sit around the campfire, and it's quite interesting in their little houses. The houses are just tiny, tiny houses built out of stone. And all winter long, they would sit around the fire, and they would tell stories and play word games and sharpen their wits. And so one of the characteristics of Viking culture is to be clever, to be tricky, to be smart. Um, they're Indo-Europeans, okay? They're Indo-Europeans, and they come from the very same culture as the Greeks, the Hittites, the Romans, the Germans. So that they share that, that common culture that we find in the Indo-European culture of elected kings or chieftains, the, the elected kings or chieftains. It's that same very basic primitive um, Indo-European culture that once again washes over Europe in a new wave. So we have elected kings who can be deposed if they don't do their job properly. We have a council of elders uh, like as we have in Rome with the Roman Senate or in Greece with the with the geriatrics. Um, and we have the assembly of all free warriors who then elect the kings. Uh, and can depose them. Underneath that three-layered society, you have slaves, the slaves that they conquer. They share this Germanic culture, and they come with a warrior nomadic society uh, that is exactly like what the Germans had before they became Christian and French, and exactly like the Romans had before they became Romans, and exactly like the Greeks had before they became Greeks. And so this is the same kind of culture. Okay, this is Roskilde de Fjord. It's characteristic of the uh, of Scandinavia. It's not one of those Norwegian fjords with high, high mountains uh, plunging into the sea, but but it's characteristic of the more common fjords in in uh, Scandinavia, in um, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. This is in Denmark. And a fjord is a huge navigable bay where the big ships can pull in. And this is the dock in Roskilde where they have a museum full of Viking ships that they have pulled out of this fjord and restored in the museum. Um, because the Vikings, you know, sometimes to protect their harbors, they would sink the ships and use them as a barrier so that nobody could come in. So this is Roskilde Fjord. And here is a Viking ship in Roskilde in that, in that museum. Um, Okay, um, so that we see this ship technology. These were marvelous ships who could go speeding across the ocean. They could navigate the seas with remarkable accuracy and, and uh, from the North Sea. And this is the kind of, uh, um, uh, it's, almost, it, it, it's kind of a god that they would, they would put on the ship. It's a monster to scare away the, the land spirits. That's what it is, and the sea, and the sea serpents. Yeah, did you have a question? In that last slide, I was just kind of wondering about the scale. Like if someone was standing next to it, how large is that ship? It's very large. Uh, I would say, uh, well, our viewers can't see it, but from that end of that desk all the way to that end of that desk. Okay, three three desk widths long. And that's and there are larger ones than that in the museum, but that, that particular one, that's how large it is. 
you can you can count how many men would be on it by counting the ore holes that are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Uh, about twenty-eight men on that ship, and who would sit and row in unison. Uh, in order to go into port, but then they had big sails so that they could sail across the Atlantic and they could read the tides. They could read the tides and the currents and they could read the, the waves and the clouds. They had a sunstone so they could actually track where the sun was so that it, they could read the position of the sun and where they were. They could read the flights of birds and the, and the, um, and the fishes to see when they were getting close to land. So they were very clever, uh, and and this this is the kind of uh, a sea monster that they would mount on the on the uh, the front of the ship and the back of the ship, in or fore and aft, I guess is the proper term for that, and and this would scare away the sea serpents or the land serpents. But when they came to their own homeland, they would take this monster down. It, it's a wood carving. They take it off because they wouldn't want to scare their home land spirits away that take care of them. So this is uh, this is from the Oseberg ship in um, Norway. Okay, here are the Vikings. They're sturdy. They're a sturdy bunch. Here is a, a man in the, from the museum in Riva with typical Viking clothing. And the, the Swedes have a saying: um, "There's no bad weather, just bad clothing." So that this is typical of the Viking spirit. Here's a woman, a Viking woman, and women were very uppity in the Viking culture. They had a lot of freedom, and you know, who do you think took took care of the farm and the household uh, and, and held the keys to the storeroom while the Vikings were out Viking? It was the women who ran everything, and and uh, they could divorce their husbands. They had they had lots of rights. Women had a lot of freedom. Uh, in the culture. Uh, here you can see her cloak, which is um, pinned to her little pinafore that she has with, with some with some brooches. If you can see those brooches in that picture, and here are, here are some pictures of the brooches. Um, they're Germanic, and so they did the same kind of exquisite metal work that the Germans did that we talked about, that the, the metal workers that are that are um, typical of nomads who travel from one place to another. You can't build big cathedrals and take them with you. You can have little pieces of art that are metalwork. Um, they wore chain link mail, just like all the Germanic warriors in France wore at that time. They're woven, woven together, links of metal woven together into what you would think of as an iron sweater that you put over your head like a sweater, very heavy. And this protected them perfectly well until gun, guns were invented. Uh, this kind of armor was common all over Europe. The Vikings actually shared a common culture with all Europeans. This is a rune stone. They had a written language, and they left written records. Um, they tended to be inscriptions like this one. You read this one, if you look at the lower left-hand corner, and you read that by going up around and down and up around again. You read it from front to back. Uh, and these are runes. That, the runes were originally made to be carved in stone uh, and, and so, or in wood. Uh, uh, they exchanged a lot of messages in wooden, in, in pieces of wood of various kinds. And so that's why all the, all the strokes of the runes are are straight so that you can do it with a knife into wood. But it's a written language, and, and R.I. Page has argued that the Vikings were literate throughout the northern world, that they used this language in an everyday way to write letters and, and messages to each other. Uh, what survives are these kinds of rune stones where there are messages that they left along the places that they visited, as this one does a marker that shows. Uh, essentially, and it, it has the name of the people who were there. It might have the name of somebody who died, or it might have the name of a great deed that they did, a battle, for example, or a discovery they made anywhere they went. And there are thousands of rune stones all over Scandinavia. This is a very famous rune stone, the Yelling Stone, that's set up in Yelling in Denmark, in Jutland. Um, and this is one side of it with 
with a monster on it. I'm sorry I didn't put the other side of it in, but it's the first crucifix that you find in Scandinavia, and it was uh, it was uh, set up by uh, Harold Bluetooth on his conversion to Christianity uh, at the tomb of his father, actually. And so this is a very famous rune stone. Um, they, they do raiding and trading. At first they went out and they only uh, went out at summers at, uh, at first and they would raid every summer. And other times they would winter over as time went by. They would find a good base to winter over. And as I said, Europe was kind of prostrate, you know. It was engulfed in civil war and it was very difficult to control. And so the Vikings had a pretty wide open field to invade Europe. Okay, this is the Oseberg tapestry. The Oseberg ship burial is the burial of a Viking queen. It's a woman who is buried. And this is a very famous tapestry that shows um, the intricacies of Viking life with their horses and their, and their uh, carts and the men and women who are involved in Viking life. It's, this is a wonderful, um, there's a priest is the very first figure on the left. Uh, this one is carrying a cross, or, or else it's a sword. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. I'm, um, uh, this, this is a drawing that is a little bit problematic because if you look at the real tapestry, it's very hard to make out these lines of where they were. Um, okay, So this is typical of Viking life. Uh, they raided and traded, and here's a coin hoard. There are coin hoards all over Scandinavia, and you can kind of date where they were raiding and trading because you can find in here Byzantine coins and Islamic coins and Persian coins and English coins and, and French coins. Um, uh, these are probably Muslim or Islamic or Persian because they're gold, and Europe was on a silver standard. And so if you have silver coins, they're probably European. Of course, you would, you would get close to them and read them and see what they are. Uh, they were warriors in, in a stream of warriors, just like the Roman warriors and the Greek warriors. Uh, the, uh, um, here is a Scandinavian or European warriors, and they were from the same kind of warrior society as these warriors. This is a Scandinavian depiction of knights going into battle, fighting dragons on the bottom level, and um, uh, finding a piece, returning home with the lions uh, in the top register, triumphant. Okay, so this is a Scandinavian wood carving. Uh, here uh, showing the Vikings as being very like the Europeans. Um, they had a tremendous impact on Europe. Here they are. Here's a map. You can see all the places they went. Um, they're very like the Greeks. Remember that the Greeks with uh, Odysseus, uh, Odysseus explored the entire Mediterranean world and he sailed out to have adventures everywhere, and the Vikings are doing the very same thing. They're very adventurous, they're, they're nomadic, and they want to go to a lot of different places. Now that they've become a seafaring people, they go everywhere. And here you can see the Swedes to the, going to the east and founding the Russian state. The, the, the kingdoms of Kiev and Novgorod are founded by as Viking states in order to link together the trade of Constantinople and Byzantium to link that to Scandinavia. So it's a great trading network. Um, they, they only lived in the southern part of Scandinavia, as you can see here. Uh, the northern part was not settled, but at the same time there was this movement to the east and to the west. There was also a movement northward to um, settle in the northern part of Scandinavia. South of Denmark, you see that they settled along the coast of Frisia. Frisia is the, the northern European part where they go down the rivers of Europe. Moving further to the south, they settled in Normandy and later became the Normans. So that's where they settled in Europe. In England, they conquered all of England. They conquered England three times, actually. Three separate times they conquered England. And there's a huge infusion of Viking culture in England. And, and when you have, at the time of the Norman conquest, when the Normans conquer England, William the Conqueror, you know, 1066, 
um, uh, you, you rightly could, must call them Anglo-Scandinavians because they've been ruled by an English king for a whole generation by the time that the Normans conquered England. The Normans conquered Ireland uh, and they founded the first cities in Ireland. There were no cities at all in Ireland before the Normans came there and there were no states in Ireland and so the kingdoms of Ireland formed as a result of the Vikings settling there and conquering it. The same is true of Scotland. They conquered mostly in the north of Scotland as you can see on that map. Uh, the northern part of um, uh, Orkney, the Orkney Islands are at the very top of Scotland and they discovered groups of islands. The Shetland Islands are even north of the Orkneys and if you see in the middle the Faroe Islands halfway between um, the Shetlands and Iceland. They discovered Iceland and empty land and these are all relatively empty lands they're going to um, empty in the sense that they're not organized kingdoms. Either they're very sparsely settled with disorganized primitive people or there are no people at all as is the case in Iceland and Greenland. So they sailed the tides and the winds across the North Atlantic. They sailed in Iceland and Iceland was the very first democracy in all of Europe. They had an institution called a thing, or ting is the, is the um, it's spelled thing, T-H-I-N-G, it's pronounced ting. And it was a kind of parliament that met once a year, uh, a national parliament in Iceland, and Iceland was divided into four quarters, and there was a local ting in each of the four quarters where cases were judged and uh, judged at court and, and laws were passed for either the local region or for the entire area of Iceland. So we have the first democracy in Europe formed in Iceland out of this basic Germanic uh, culture. They then went on to Greenland, which they found was empty. They had a sense of humor, uh, if you know, well, except that Greenland is melting today, but it used to be a chunk of ice, and so they named it Greenland. Um, whereas Iceland, the name Iceland doesn't mean ice, it means it's a Scandinavian way to say island. And so the word Iceland means island, not, not land of ice. Then they sailed across, once they reached Greenland, they sailed across to the Americas. And in Nova Scotia, there are Viking, uh, re remains of Viking settlements. So we know they reached the New Worlds and their sagas uh, tell us uh, of the journeys there that they had, they had outposts there that they returned to again and again and again. Um, they, their lines were stretched too far to stay in the New World. This was in the year 1000 that they actually reached the New World. Their, their lines were stretched too thin. There were too few of them and too many hostile American Indians who drove them out. And so that's why they didn't remain in the New World. But they certainly reached it. And we think they sailed all the way down the coast. Some people think they got all the way to Florida. So, so they went out adventuring and exploring and, and burst out upon the whole world. And here we see a close-up of the state of Russia. Uh, uh, you see Normandy, Frisia, and England, Ireland, and Scotland, where they, where they, where they raided and settled and stayed. Okay, and here are the tides of the Atlantic that they followed, the winds and the tides to get across the Atlantic. Uh, they had an enormous impact on Europe. One of the first things that happened was they created new states. These invasions created new states, so you have new peoples brought into Europe. Russia is one of these Viking states. Um, another to the south of Russia. Um, is the Magyar state which became Hungary. Okay, this is around 910 um, at the time that Russia was forming. One of your readings is the Russian primary chronicle that tells of the Viking settlement of Russia, by the way. Here by the year 1000, we have the formation of the major countries in the east of Europe that didn't exist before the Vikings got there, Russia, Hungary, and Poland. So we have the conversion taking place in those areas, conversion to Christianity, and the creation of new states. 
Okay, we have the New World settlements we've already talked about, the Orkneys, the Shetlands, the Faroes, Iceland, Greenland, and Vinland. Uh, here they are. Here we see the New World areas that they settled. Iceland, Greenland, Heluland, Markland, and Vinland were the New World settlements that they discovered. Here is Thor's Nest Things. Uh, this is the place where the Thing or the Ting met in Iceland. Um, uh, this is one of the regional uh, tings, uh, and in the center is the Dune Ring and Thor's Stone. Uh, Thor's Stone is where they, they, the law speaker spoke the law for the for the whole year. Yeah. When are they converting to Christianity, and is it missionaries that are doing this? And if so, where are they coming from, the missionaries? That's a wonderful question. I could spend the rest of the lecture on it, but I won't. <laughs> um, in a nutshell. There was a duel between the Germans, the Germans to send missionaries to Denmark and Sweden and Norway and the English. And so there were two sets of missionaries coming and the Danes of course were resisting both of them and trying to play one off against the other. As it turns out, the Danes were able to keep their church independent of the Germans and independent of the English as well and, and, and to build their own national church. Uh, the conversion is a really good question, and it's very important. Very important. There's a. There's a. I heard a talk uh, while I was in Scandinavia uh, two weeks ago um, about the conversion of Denmark, and the argument was essentially that the Ottonian Empire, uh, with its creation of courtier bishops who were literate and, and skilled bureaucrats and, and very well educated and became agents of the Ottonian emperor and ran his government uh, to, to keep the, um, the lay barons weak, that this was a model that the Scandinavians wanted and this is why Scandinavia was converted because the kings wanted, they liked the idea of strong kingship that Christianity presented because remember we started out by saying they were not unified, they were, they, they, you, had, you had lots and lots of little kinglets and little chieftains running around and so Christianity unified Scandinavia into the states of Sweden, Denmark and Norway because strong kingship was very appealing to the kings and it was the kings who largely converted. The missionaries came, the kings converted, and the people resisted. They didn't want to be Christian. They loved their religion. They thought it was just fine. It was the kings who forced it on them and they used these missionaries to, to help make their governments more strong. Um, so Christianity was very appealing to the kings, but not to the people. They, they thought it was fine the way it was. And, and, and this next slide shows the, the, the difficulty of assimilating Christianity. These are, the, these are the side door panels of a Christian church, one of those stave churches in Norway. And it shows the pre-Christian legend of Sigurd the, the dragon slayer. <laughs> And what they're doing is using the old legend of Sigurd, the saga of Sigurd, um, and, and this represents Christianity. And, and so Sigurd slaying the dragon represents Christ slaying Satan. And, and so they, they kept all those old Scandinavian legends and, and characters, and they, they just gave them Christian meaning. But it was very hard for Christianity to um, root out the old Scandinavian religion. It lasted for centuries after that remnants of it. Um, this is interesting. This is a door panel in southern Italy um, that is very like, see those door panels? These are door panels on either side of the church door on the stave church in Norway. And here is a very similar door panel in southern Italy where Norman settled um, because the Vikings who settled in Normandy became Normans and we're going to come back to that in a moment but you can see the, the similarities in these two cultures. Well, the Vikings impacted Europe enormously, as I said. First, we had, uh, the, um, we had the formation of new states in the east. We had actually the formation of new states. I should have said we had the formation of new states also in, um, 
in Scotland and Ireland as a result of the Viking invasions. The first kingdom of Ireland formed in resistance to the Vikings, and the same can be said of Scotland at that time. So let's go back to this story again. Um, at least one historian, and there are a couple of others who agree, think that the Vikings brought the heavy plow from Scandinavia to Europe. And the heavy plow was extremely important because it caused an agricultural revolution throughout Europe. One thing that happened in the year 1000 is peace broke out all over. The Vikings converted. The Magyars settled down and converted to Christianity. Uh, the Saracens, the, the, the Christians were able to drive the Saracen pirates out of the sea. And so peace broke out all over. The Vikings brought the heavy plow, I think. I, I agree that they did bring the heavy plow. And the heavy plow was extremely important because the lands of northern Europe and Russia and, and across northern Europe and England were very thick and heavy and wet. Along the Mediterranean Sea, you could, you could plow with just a stick plow. You could drag it along, and you could drop your seeds into the furrow it made. But the soils of northern Europe were completely resistant to that. They were too wet and too heavy. The heavy plow, as you see here, has lots of movable parts. And it's a very complex machine that digs under the soil and turns it over making furrows and hills. So you can see the sort of furrows and hills that are here with where the heavy plow plows. And this meant you could open up all the lands of northern Europe to cultivation, where there were just forests before. The forest could be cleared, and you could open them up to cultivation. And so this is the, the agricultural revolution. In addition, wherever the heavy plow went, uh, you have a new uh, planting system. The old Roman two-field system, you would plant half your land for the year and let the other half of the land lie fallow to revive itself. In, wherever the heavy plow was, there was a medieval three-field system so that on one-third of your land, you planted <coughs> spring crops. And these were new crops, crops legumes like bees and pea, peas and beans and clover. And, and you would plant that on one third of your land. Fall crops would be wheat and rye and barley you would plant in the fall to give them a head start for the spring. And then on the fallow third of your land, you would graze the animals to fertilize it. Now look at the legumes, the spring crops. They have special characteristics. One thing is they put nitrogen into the soil and fertilize it. So now you're getting a double fertilization of the land. In addition, plants like peas and beans have a lot of protein in them. So now they have a lot more protein in their diet. This means they have a better diet. They're growing more food because they're farming two thirds of their land instead of half and it's better food so that they have more protein. And so this means their health improves. And what happens is a population explosion. You have a lot, the population grows because of the agricultural revolution. Better food, healthier people, longer lifespans. Um, and here you see the development of the manor. We talked about the medieval manor. You can always tell where the heavy plow was because there are strips of land. And the reason is, let's go back to our picture of the plow. This is a medieval manor, and we talked about that already. But here's a medieval plow. Um, this one only shows four oxen. A lot of pictures show it being drawn by eight oxen. And if you have eight oxen pulling your plow, you don't want to turn it around very much, do you? So you start at 6 AM, and you plow in one direction till noon. You eat lunch, you turn the plow around and plow home until 6 p.m. And that means that you end up with these long, narrow strip fields. And so you can fly in an airplane over Europe. And wherever you see long, narrow strip fields, then you know the heavy plow was there. And so you see the land being cleared at that time. This is a medieval village. It's almost like a town with a castle or a manor house and the shared common lands around it, the village where the peasants are. And each peasant and lord has his, his own strip of land. OK, you can see that here. This is, an, this is a later one. You can see all those strip fields. You see the long, narrow fields. We know the heavy plow was used there. And what this means is all of northern Europe could be opened up to plow lands. 
there was a population explosion and a commercial revolution. We're going to see trade routes opened up all over Europe. This is a, this is a covered wagon, and literally a covered wagon that we have in the American West is a medieval covered wagon. It comes from uh, medieval culture. And so here we see this wagon traveling the roads. Um, the cart carrying corn, that doesn't mean corn, it means wheat. Um, corn is a, is a generic word for wheat or grain, okay? You have a population explosion and you have a commercial revolution, the rise of trade because there's great demand for goods and for food and so you see the, the, um, the, the growth of trade routes everywhere. But before we go to the growth of trade routes and the growth of cities, let's look at another important result of the year 1000. This is the technological revolution. Okay, this is the old way of grinding grain with a hand mill where you turn that crank and you, and you grind the, the, the grain by hand. Uh, the water mill became the, the machine of medieval Europe. We see water mills in, in, as late as the fall of the Roman Empire in the third and fourth and fifth century. Every town, uh, every, every monastery had a water mill because there was a great labor shortage. In the year 1000, you suddenly see the explosion of water mills everywhere. Everybody wants to have a water mill on every river and stream and tide of all of Europe. It becomes, becomes extremely important because this is the industrial revolution of the Middle Ages. Think of the water mill as what the, steam, what the steam engine was later. It uses the power of nature, the power of flowing water, to replace human or animal energy. And so we have a kind of mini industrial revolution going on. You can manufacture things with a water mill. You can process cloth, you can tan leather, you can saw, uh, you can saw logs with this, with this energy from the water wheel. You can pump water out of mines or you can pump water into fields with these water mills. Um, here are the two kinds of water mills. They, they tried various ways of using them. This is the overshot water, water wheel where the water pours over the wheel and turns it or the undershot wheel, the breast wheel where it, where it goes under the wheel and turns it. Jean Gimpel has written a book called The Medieval Machine, The Industrial Revolution of the Middle Ages. So water mills and windmills power the economy. I have windmills there because everybody who had a stream or a river or a tide who wanted to build a water mill, but what if you didn't have a stream or water or, or any water on your land, or what if it froze in the wintertime? Remember, we're in the north of Europe. What are you going to do for power? Well, these were very inventive people, and so they invented the windmill. And so the windmill, you could just throw up together with a few sticks, and you had a power machine that could actually turn and grind grain and saw wood and tan leather and pound pound things that needed to be pounded and pump water and, 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 and do all of these things that uh, water mills could do. And so immediately the, the uh, uh, Immediately when the windmill was invented, they were they spread like lightning all over Europe, and everybody wanted to build a, a windmill on their land. Here's another windmill. They're famous for being in Holland um, uh, because they pump the water out of the out of the low parts of the area and, and uh, um, drain the land. Okay. Now, there's an urban revolution. You have a population explosion. There are a lot more people. You've got merchants going out and fairs being held around castles and monasteries. Goods are being sold. Uh, at first, the merchants just go from, from one small castle or monastery to another. Um, they hold a fair, and then, and then pretty soon the fair becomes permanent, and what do you know, towns and cities are growing up around the castles and the monasteries, because you've got lots of excess people. And this is true on the manors. You've got too many people for the manor to support, so they go to live, they become merchants and live in the town. 
uh, here's one of these towns. This is Marseille in the south of France that becomes a great early center of trade. In the urban revolution, if you had now have people living in cities when most people had lived before in the countryside, you have the creation of new classes in the city, the bourgeoisie. You have, um, you have tradesmen who work in cities. You have townsmen. You have the growth of labor unions. Um, and merchants and all of the and town halls and town government and all of those uh, uh, facilities that are needed to uh, support a town and here are merchants and you have merchants who travel just you know just down the road or from farm to market or you have merchants who uh, travel from um, one from a city in England all the way to Rome or to the Holy Land, uh, all across the Mediterranean, long distance merchants uh, who travel, uh, who invest in um, in large scale trade. These are merchants. Okay, and here is Carcassonne in southern France, one of the great cities of France that are growing up at this time. Uh, this is a result of the peace breaking out and the new prosperity of the agricultural revolution and the technological revolution. Okay, and here are the trade routes that are set up. Notice the trade routes in the North Sea around Scandinavia that are very prominent because of the Vikings have opened up trade to the North Sea and then the connection of land routes be from between the north and the south uh, going across um, Central Europe here and so this is the um, this is the commercial revolution of the growing of these trade routes okay Norman ships uh, uh, not only trade across land but across the whole Mediterranean trade is revived in the Mediterranean Sea and in the North Sea this is a Norm Norman ship that would be plying the seas in the North uh, in the North Sea region of Europe okay and here we see the trade routes going continuing from Italy where we, where we sort of cut them off on the other map and going all the way to the Holy Land with the Crusades, okay? Now we see another revolution going on in Europe and this is stepping outside the boundaries of Europe. We saw that Europe was created by Charlemagne. Really, if we take Perrin's thesis that without Mohammed there would have been no Charlemagne and that the cutting off of the Mediterranean meant that the Europeans turned northward and looked to the north of Europe as their center, the center of European culture. Yes, that's true in the time of Charlemagne, but the Vikings change all that. Now we have the Europeans breaking out of their boundaries of just France, France and Germany and England. Now they go to the Holy Land and the Crusades, then set up the Crusader states. You can think of these as the first empire building in Europe and the first colonies, if you want to think about uh, about colonialism, that you can think of these uh, crusader states in the Holy Land as colonies, but they're failed. They're failed colonies. Um, you have to, I mean, because they only last a hundred years. We've already talked a little bit about the Crusades, but. Um, Crusader states didn't last very long. It just reminds you of the Vikings settling in the Americas. The supply lines were too long. The, uh, the, the people that were there, there were too few people and too many resistant natives. And so for the same reason that the Vinland colonies that the Vikings founded in the New World didn't last and, and, and didn't work, the same can be said about the Crusader states. Um, the supply lines were too long, there wasn't enough manpower, and within a hundred years, um, the Muslims had driven the Crusaders out of the Holy Land. But, but the lasting effect of the Crusades was it opened the trade routes between um, Europe and the Holy Land and then we have this massive movement of trade. It's really Venice that carries the ball on that and the Venetian Empire is, is the engine of those trading routes. 
You also see the stepping outside of Europe we've already mentioned uh, in, in, into the Mediterranean. The, here is Alexandria in Egypt, which is connected to the trade routes of, for example, Venice. Um, uh, and here are 11th century warriors going out to battle in the Crusades. And here are Crusaders. The Crusades actually lasted hundreds of years, uh, but, but it was only the first one that was successful. The rest of them were futile attempts to regain the Holy Land, and it was never regained. Okay, also uh, here is Spain. Uh, the, the, the successful Crusades were Crusades that were in Europe itself, in, in the continent of Europe, driving the Muslims out of Spain. This is the reconquest of Spain. That was a very successful crusade. Um, also, there were northern crusades. Remember I, remember I mentioned the creation of new states, Poland, Hungary, and Russia as new states. That's breaking outside of the boundaries of Europe to the east. And you also see a crusading movement in the north to convert the Baltic states, um, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. Those free, free, three states were converted, as were the Wends and the Russians, of course. So the Northern Crusades break out of the boundaries of Europe and increase, increase the um, land area that Europe actually covers. So Europe is reaching out to its full extent. Okay. Um, I started out by saying the Vikings were really essential to the creation of Europe. And um, uh, I've talked about the impact of the Vikings and the, and the kinds of things they did in Europe, the, the way they changed Europe. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the European response to the Viking invasions, because this also was a factor in the creation of Europe. Um, in France, look at the map of France, and I, I haven't really done that map right because the, the green part that, that I, I have as the actual kingdom of France, um, I should have some, some more counties in France. If you look at France, the response to the Vikings was to fragment it completely. Uh, the old Carolingian Empire, which you remember, was a unified France and Germany, the whole area of France and Germany. Now look at France. It's a whole bunch of little independent counties. And so France was shattered by the Viking invasions. It's no longer unified, but it's broken up into little independent units. And so the response in France is to create a new kind of government and a new kind of order. Okay, and what they create is usually called feudalism. Okay, but you're not supposed to use that word anymore. <laughs> it's not permitted because um, um, uh, Peggy Brown wrote an article 25 years ago that said there's no such thing as feudalism. The term is a 19th century invention, so now historians don't use that term anymore. They write books about lordship and vassalage or, or uh, lordship and community, or they, or they write about chivalry or, um, or um, courtliness. Okay. We had a talk last week on chivalry. Okay, so you can't call it feudalism anymore, but you could call it chivalry. So, but the result of the Viking invasions is they take those old Carolingian institutions, like remember the oath of, of loyalty that every man in the Carolingian Empire had to swear to Charlemagne. This turns into homage, and now you no longer swear it to a king, but you swear it to your local count or your local duke. And so they take these Carolingian institutions and they localize them, they break them down, and they're using them in little local communities. So that each in, in each little community, the vassals would do homage to the Lord and swear fealty. Fealty is nothing but an oath of loyalty to the Lord. And you would have lords who would be running the local county, and vassals would be the uh, people in their army who would serve them. A serf is a kind of vassal. A serf is a, is a kind of agricultural um, person who is loyal to his lord who serves. And um, let's look at some pictures now. 
um, we, we'll look at some pictures, but what we have is the reconfiguration of the Carolingian elements in a new way on only a local level. This is not the breakdown of order. This is not the loss of order, and it's not the creation of anarchy. What it is is a different kind of order that is, that is organized on a local level and not a national level. It's just like in the United States. You know, we have, we have the federal government that rules the whole country, and we have state governments that are small portions of that whole country, and we have county governments that rule very local areas. Well, this is that kind of order on a local level, and you just don't have a strong national government here. Yeah. At this time, are any of these lords and vassals literate, or is it mostly still contained to monasteries? Oh, well, that's, a, that's a whole two lectures. <laughs> Um, I, that's my field of research, so I could talk to you for three days about it. Um, literature is in, uh, literacy is in the monasteries. The monasteries are the preserver of that culture. Uh, I've just written a book on this. Uh, and, and, and laymen are literate at this time. There, there is a vast culture of literacy. There are, there are schools. Uh, some, of, some of the people are trained in um, monasteries. The laymen are taught in monasteries. There are also individual local schools where laymen can be taught. There are cathedral schools. And, and this is a huge topic. I mean, I'm, I'm just being very cursory here. but. But you know, the short answer is uh, that starting in the year 1000, you see this, this burgeoning of literacy. And so by the year 1200, when you, when you do see France and England coalescing into unified governments, they have these literate laymen in order to, in order to make the government work. You have to have literate people to keep records and, and issue writs and issue charters, and so they're literate. Um, so you have to read my book to see how that happens, so. <laughs> it's not out yet. Okay, so you have a new kind of order and a new kind of justice on a local level, and this is what happens to France. It organizes in a very localized way all over France. Uh, feudalism, here is the term feudalism that's no longer allowed to be used, but you can use the term chivalry if you want to, um, to describe the same thing, a man in armor and a helmet. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what happens to war is really interesting. I just came back from a conference and there was a wonderful talk uh, about war. And, and um, the thing is, these people are not fighting battles against each other. It's not a time of anarchy where everybody's just killing e each other willy-nilly. Um, uh, war becomes like a game. Okay, so that it's you're acting out the bravery and the and the the pretense. It's almost play acting, play acting theater of fighting each other like a tournament. And and they have literal tournaments all over France where they where they where they joust and they pretend to fight each other and you know they never kill each other. But when they have an actual battle, it's very seldom. Mostly they blockade a city and besiege it and try to starve them out. But when they do have an actual battle, they rarely kill anybody. What they do is take them captive and hold them for ransom. Take their horse and their armor, which is worth a lot of money. It's like having a Rolls Royce to take somebody's horse and their armor. That's how much money you would get from it. And then you hold them for ransom and their family has to pay to get them back. So why kill people when you can hold them for ransom? And so this is the kind of battles they're fighting. We're not having bloody battles anymore. We're having ritualistic play acting and they're almost like games, they're games that they're, that they're playing. And so here we have this kind of ritualistic game here. Is a, okay. Oh, we just have a black one. Okay, and, and this is when the Song of Roland is written. And again, you can compare the Song of Roland to other Indo-European uh, um, pieces of literature like the Viking sagas, for example, like the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Aeneid. The Iliad and the Odyssey are Greek. The Aeneid is Roman. The Song of Roland, uh, the, uh, 
Mahabharata in India. Again, these Indo-European sagas or, or um, uh, epics, epic poems. And here is a song of Roland that embodies all of the chivalrous culture in what Roland is doing. Here we see a set piece battle almost like a game and we see the burial of the dead. Well, they talk a big game about killing people, but they actually don't. You know, this is why the Crusades were such an, an enormous shock on the people who went on the first crusade because they were used to playing play acting games and, and, and not real battles, just acting them out. And when they got to the Holy Land, well, well people actually got killed there. It was like they had to face post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome because they weren't used to fighting battles where people got killed. And so you can really see this in the crusading literature. So here is, is the Song of Roland, which shows this kind of war as theater, you know, not real war. Okay, here is uh, a man doing homage. He's putting his hands between the hands of the Lord, and they will seal that bargain with a feudal kiss. Okay, and, and so this is the homage being done. Castles, castles are part of the new order of things. The word castle is derived from the Latin word castella, which means little fort. So a castle is a little fort and it's quite small. Here's a very famous one, Chateau Gaillard, and you can see it on the left, towering up above the land, and you can see it on the right. Uh, castles are always built on a hill so that they can command the entire countryside. And if you don't have a hill where you are, you build an artificial one and build the castle on top of it because a castle is supposed to be on top of a hill or a high point where they can command the whole countryside. And here you see this castle. This is the same castle, Chateau Gaillard, on the top of a hill commanding the entire valley and the river that it's in. Okay. And so this is this is a hallmark of French uh, of French uh, chivalry. Uh, the castle is inseparable from all the other elements of French chivalry. Okay, um, that's the French reaction: feudalism or chivalry. The German reaction is something different. It's unification under the Ottonians: Otto the first, Otto the second, and Otto the third. And it's the creation of the Ottonian Empire. And I mentioned to you a moment ago when you asked me about conversion, which was a really good question, by the way, the, 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 the missionaries to Scandinavia were coming from the Ottonian Empire. And the ideal that the Scandinavians saw in the Ottonian Empire were these courtly bishops. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Stephen Jaeger called uh, The Origins of Courtliness, and he talks about um, courtliness as, as these literate, elegant, well-educated bishops who serve at the, uh, at the imperial court in Germany, and they literally take over the government. And what they do is give the emperors a core of administrators who, can, who are bureaucrats who administer the empire that totally weakens the power of the, the counts and the dukes who are in the tribal duchies. Because this is, this is kind of an illusion that Germany is unified. It's not actually, it's divided up into what are called tribal duchies, just like France. But Germany is able to be unified because of these courtly bishops who can carry out the will of the king, and they are loyal to the king, and they supersede the power of the dukes and, and, the, um, and the counts. As a result, you have the Ottonian Renaissance, which we already talked about a little bit briefly, but here is Otto II and presiding over his court like an emperor. And you see his courtly bishops on the left there by his side who are running the state. And you see the, tri the, the, the dukes and the counts on the right who are swearing homage to him in the feudal manner, 
but they really challenge his authority because they would like to take over if they if they had a, the slightest chance they would take over the government and overthrow the king so he uses the bishops for the unity and this is this is the model that the Scandinavian kings saw that they wanted for themselves and this is one of the reasons they converted to Christianity because they wanted these courtly bishops and they got them it's the bishops who converted Scandinavia, not the missionaries. There are no monks going in there as missionaries in Scandinavia. They're bishops. They're courtly bishops, and they come from the Ottonian court. And this is, uh, we said there's an Ottonian renaissance, the flowering of, of art and culture and writing and literature, because they've got a learned court here. And this is some of the art that comes from that court. This is a symbol of the power of the emperor. I've shown you this picture before. And here you see all the nations of Europe doing homage, bending the knee to the emperor. Here on the left is Slavia, Slovenia, and so the Slavs is the first figure on the left. The second figure on the left is Germania, and then the next figure moving to the right is Gallia, and finally Roma, so France and Rome. So we have the Slavs, Germany, France, and Rome bowing the knee to that emperor and becoming his vassals. Okay, and so here is an example of feudal order. Where feudalism in France represents local order, feudalism in Germany is a national order of a kind of state. So feudalism represents order in this case. And here are some German knights who would be happy to rebel against the king if he didn't have all those wonderful bishops helping him control everything. Okay, German knights. Uh, and here is a battle. Uh, again, I've mentioned, I've mentioned the battles of the German the German dukes rebelled a lot, and when we talk about the 12th century, when we later on, we'll, we'll see what happens to the Germans who are so rebellious. Uh, we have to talk about England very briefly, and the English response to the Viking invasions. Remember I told you that the Vikings conquered England three times? Um, the second conquest is met by King Alfred, and here you see on the left is Alfred's kingdom. Actually, the Vikings conquered all of England, every speck of it except one little island. Alfred fought back and gained that yellow part, but he had, this is the Treaty of Wedmore in um, 678, 878. Alfred had to make concessions to the Vikings, and that purple part is called the Dana Law, D-A-N-E-L-A-W, the Dana Law, and that's where he had to let the Vikings settle, and they colonized that whole purple area. It's called the Dana Law because they lived under Danish law, not under English law. Now, Alfred's sons and grandsons brought the Dana law under their own control and created a unified state. The, the Danes eventually pledged um, their loyalty to Alfred's grandson, Ethelstan, and we have a unified English state that Ethelstan thinks of as a kind of empire. So this is one of the responses Alfred, Alfred actually builds um, uh, roads all over England. He builds burgs or fortified, uh, fortified uh, places in England where people can go to uh, um, have protection against Viking raids, and he builds a navy. But what ends up is a unified state. And so that's the first response of England. We'll talk about some other responses of England because the Vikings actually conquer England again after, after um, Alfred saves it and then it's conquered again. Um, this is the site of Alfred's battle, uh, the Battle of Wedmore, where he actually takes control. Uh, it makes a treaty with Guthrum and takes a control of England. Uh, he creates the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which you see here is a, a, another renaissance, a revival of literacy, but not in Latin, not the Latin that they're using in Germany, in the Ottonian Empire. This is in the vernacular. This is in English, in an old English that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is written. And schools are built all over England. Alfred, just like Charlemagne, sponsors the building of schools. Here is an English school book, an Anglo-Saxon school book. 
and you see the Latin, the, the large letters are Latin, and the little teeny um, uh, writings above each line, those are in Anglo-Saxon. They're translating it. Okay. Normandy, the rise of Normandy. Are the Vikings gone at this point? No, they're not gone. They're settled in the Danela and they're settled in Normandy. So we have Vikings settled in Normandy. Here's a close-up of Normandy. There's a lot of intermarriage between the Vikings and the French in Normandy. And what do you know? A new power is arising in Europe and the, the, the Normans become one of the foremost powers in the creation of Europe. You all, what did the Normans do? The only date you need to know in medieval history is 1066. <laughs> At least the English say that. Um, the Norman conquest in 1066 when William the Conqueror sails across the English Channel and conquers England. And a lot of historians say that's when English history begins. Well, that's not true, but at least the English monarchy begins with William the Conqueror conquering England. And some historians say, here's, here's, here are some pictures from the Bayeux Tapestry, which should make you think of the Oseberg Tapestry that I showed you earlier from Norway. Is the Bayeux Tapestry, was it the last great Viking conquest? Well, some people have said the last great Viking conquest. But even that is not exactly true. From the English point of view, it's the last great Viking conquest, but not from the Italian point of view, because in 1091, Normans concluded their settlement of southern Italy by conquering Sicily and creating another great empire. Uh, Norman England became the strongest state in all of northern Europe. Norman Italy and Sicily became the strongest state in southern Italy. The Normans, who were descendants of the Viking settlers intermarried with the French, were the greatest state builders in Europe. And so we see uh, the creation of that other empire you never hear of, that other conquest is the conquest of Italy and Sicily by the Normans. So now we've seen a great social revolution in addition to all the other revolutions of the year 1000. Now we see a social revolution with the growth of cities, the growth of castles, the growth of feudalism and the commercial and urban revolutions we've already seen with the growth of trade networks that didn't exist in the year 1000. Now, a hundred years later, they're, they're European-wide. Agricultural and technological revolutions that, that changed Europe dramatically. So, I made an argument to you today that the Viking invasions were, were very instrumental in creating medieval Europe. Um, okay, thank you for your questions. We're out of time right now. So, uh, next week, I think we're going to look at the Mongols. Okay, so, see you next week.